You know what time it is? Ha! Get it to it! Get it to it! Wait, whoa! <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. My hair is still wet. Hi. Welcome back. You know what time it is. It's story time with Chris. I'm gonna get a theme song. I'm gonna get a theme song and pat that. Hi, y'all. Welcome back. It's been a minute. Welcome back for story time with Chris. I had to take my glasses off because this beautiful selfie rig light, shout out to Lazai and Phil, is really bright. I can decrease it, which I wonder. Oh, that's nice. That's not as empowering. Let me see. Ooh, okay. I didn't know I could adjust color like that. I'll have to experiment with that later. But we are back with a different type of story that I don't think anyone was expecting. But for those who are familiar with the film, oh, I know this is gonna, ah, gotta put the hand behind the product. Okay. So, I bought this several years ago at Dark Star Bookstore. Shout out to Dark Star. Um, I've seen the movie growing up, love My Neighbor Totoro, love Studio Ghibli, love Hayao Miyazaki. The novel is by Sukiko Kubo. So we are going to be reading My Neighbor Totoro. Um, there may be some differences from the film um, in relation to the book, but that always happens with adaptations. But, um, oh, they give you a little map of the neighborhood and everything. That's dope. I hope y'all can see. Hey, Dad. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Pretty sure a few people are going to hop on here. But as I always say, you do not have to watch these videos when they go live. You could always um, watch them in your downtime, you know, in between work. You put the kids down for a nap if you want a highly animated voice to read stories to you here you've come to the right place welcome to story time as i always say reading is not just fundamental it is essential it helps us learn about different languages helps us learn different perspectives different cultures different walks of life and broadens our horizons it doesn't matter how old or young you are you should always be reading whether it's a book a magazine a manga a comic book a novella a newspaper Whatever it may be, you should always be reading because reading is not just fundamental, it is essential. So without further ado, we will begin the reading of My Neighbor Totoro, which I do not own the music that you will hear in the background. Which is, of course, from my wonderful, and I'm starting to become a huge fan, Mr. Ambiance. <clears throat> got my good tea going. Here we go. Chapter 1. The New Old House The little three-wheel truck rolled along the country road. May and May, riding along in May, Tatsuo sang cheerfully. His white cap was pushed back on his head, on the way to Happy-Go-Lucky Forest. Uncle Fujiyama was planting planted next to him in the driver's seat. He gripped the steering wheel with both hands, stared straight ahead, and chimed in. Onward! Satsuki leaned out from the flatbed behind the cab. Her face was shining. Daddy, here's some caramel for you and uncle. She gave him two pieces of caramel wrapped in paper, or caramel wrapped in paper. The three-wheeler putted merrily along in the sunshine under the blue dome of the sky, past fields of wheat like an ocean of green that stretched as far as the eye could see. The truck was jolting and swaying so much, Satsuki was afraid her caramel would leap out of her mouth. Uncle F -F Fujiyama? How are you doing back there? He yelled over the noise of the engine. How, how far? S sorry, everything shaky. That's a country row for you. How, how much f farther is it? Tetsuo laughed. <laughs> Better hold on unless you want to fall out. I'm... Fine, because she's trying to stay still because the truck is shaky. 
Tatsuo wiped the dust off his spectacles with the tail of his shirt. That means we should be there in about 20 minutes. Yay! Satsuki cheered. She ducked down under the writing desk where her little sister May was sitting on the floor of the truck. Tatsuo and Uncle started singing again. May and May. Onward! Tatsuo and Uncle Fujiyama were, archaeolo were archaeologists who had been close friends since high school. They invited each other on digs and even wrote reports together. Whenever the family of one needed help, the other would pitch in. Yasuko, Satsuki, and May's mother had contracted tuberculosis a year ago. Now she was at the sanatorium at Sichiko Kuyama Hospital. When the time came for her to go, Uncle Fujiyama took her there himself. Now the rest of the family was moving to a new house. Things were going to be better and Satsuki was very happy. The door said that doctor said soon that Yasuko could leave the sanatorium and get better at home. So they were moving to Matsugo, a village that was much closer to the hospital. Satsuki was so happy she was fit to burst. And as always, Uncle Fujiyama came along to lend a hand. He wasn't a very good singer, though. All he could say was, onward! He was famous for his terrible singing. Saturday morning in the month of May, summer was just around the corner. The sky was so blue and so big. The road was lumpy and bumpy, and it kept going on and on. The breeze caressed the wheat, and the sun flashed off the rippling stalks, gold and green. The three-wheeler piled high with all their furniture, banged and pumped along the road as the wind blew playfully. May and May, onward! In Japanese, Sasuke was the old name for the month of May. Riding along, onward. May was four years old. Her father had named her after the month of May, too. May and May were moving to a new home in May. We're on our way to happy-go-lucky forest. Onward. Onward, cried May as she worked to peel the wrapper off of a piece of caramel. May was very small. The leg well under Tatsuo's writing desk was more than big enough for her to hide in. It didn't matter whether the three-wheeler jumped up and down or side to side. She was just fine. Satsuki had carefully piled pillows and cushions around her. This made things even more comfortable. I'll do it for you, May. Give me the caramel, Satsuki said. I'm okay. You can't unwrap it yourself. I'm okay. It's too shaky back there. I'm okay, May said. Everything is okay. She put the caramel in her mouth with the paper still stuck to it and chewed it. I bet that tastes awful, Satsuki said. I'm okay. It tastes good. Little May was quite thin. One would almost have thought she wasn't getting enough to eat. Her fine hair was gathered in pigtails to either side and stuck out behind her ears, making her look like she was all head. Her eyes were serious and smaller than her sister's. Her nose was round and her baby teeth were gappy, not like Sasuke's straight white teeth, but in a mysterious way she looked adorable. When she smiled, her cheeks dimpled and her dark, shiny eyes looked at you steadily. I could have gotten that paper off for you, May. Everything is okie dokie. Two sisters, Satsuki and May. Their mother had been in the hospital for a whole year. Satsuki was seven years older than May. She loved to read, and she could run faster than anyone at school. Everybody agreed that when it came to a fight, Sasuke Kusakabe could hold her own against any kid in the neighborhood. I can take the paper off the cabamel myself. I'm a big girl now. Though she was only four, May was determined to be just as independent as her big sister. Oh no, Satsuki yelled. Hide, May. Keep your head down. A startled May shrank back under the desk. What happened? What's wrong? A policeman. Police? May squeezed her eyes shut. <laughs> Satsuki! May whispered. She couldn't bear the suspense. Shh! If he catches us, will we go to jail? Be quiet! <laughs> Three Wheeler kept burbling its lazy song without slowing down at all. Please, God, May whispered. Please, Daddy. Please, Mommy. Satsuki, help me. Don't let them put me in the jail. Satsuki laughed. Oh, this is silly. I worked myself up there for a second. She leaned down at the truck and wave, started waving. Now it was May turned to skull. Satsuki, hide! Look, May, it's just the postman. The postman riding slowly along on his bicycle waved as they passed. 
Satsuki and May looked at each other and laughed. They dove under the desk and tumbled about in the pillows and cushions, laughing and giggling. May leaned out of the side of the truck. Look! A cemetery! Where? Oh, May, look at that! A big crow! All of a sudden, May looked very serious again. Satsuki, there's police, she gulped nervously. Do we have to go to the jail? I don't know. We'd have to pay some money, probably. Ah, the minds of children. <laughs> the pile of furniture and household things in the back of the truck would be enough to get them fined. That's what Aunt Kyoko had said to Tatsuo before they left. Anyone could see the three-wheeler was overloaded. It'll get the job done, Tatsuo had said with a laugh. He told Aunt Kyoko this would save them money moving all their things. The big chest of drawers, all the bedding, and Tatsuo's writing desk and chair. The kitchen cupboard and their round dining table, the bicycle, a big bench, the pots and the kettle, the rice bin, their umbrellas, and the wash basin and washing dishes and the washboard for washing clothes, and hundreds of books and boxes of reports and papers and Tatsuo's archaeological tools. He had taken the broken old clay pots and pieces of rock that he had dug up and stored most of them at the university. But everything else was piled at the back of the truck, and the two little girls were to ride in the back as well, though that wasn't allowed. I think we'll be fine early that morning as they carried their things out of the big Terashima house and loaded them onto the cargo bed of the blue three-wheeler. Tatsuo and Uncle Fujiyama kept surveying their work and repeating, I think we'll be fine. The little three-wheeler was a sight to behold. As the two friends tied down the mountain of furniture with rope, Grandmother Tarashima had clapped her hands and said, Looks like a big pomegranate that burst! Yatsuko had grown up in the rambling old Tarashima house near the heart of Tokyo, with the huge cherry tree rising above the black clapboard fence. Satsuki and Mei lived with their parents on the second floor. Ten years for Satsuki, four for Mei. Now they were headed for Matsuko. No longer would they be surrounded by relatives. Satsuki and Mei were eager to be off and thrilled to ride in the back of the truck. I think you'll be fine, Uncle Fujiyama said. Hop aboard, there's no room up front. They'll be fine, said Tatsuo. Which I think I think all of us from the 90s have ridden in the back of a truck. It's fun. It's a lot of room. You get to see and peek out. It's fun. Aunt Kyoko had always had a sharp tongue, but today was worse than usual because she was worried. I can't believe you're letting them ride back there, she snapped at Tatsuo. If the police see you, they'll haul you in and give you a fine. Now listen, you two. She turned to Mei and Satsuki. Don't hang out the side gawking. If you want to stay out of jail, keep out of sight, you hear? Satsuki was on pins and needles that Aunt Kyoko would insist they take the train. As she and Mei climbed into the truck and under the desk, her heart was pounding. But she had nothing to fear. Tatsuo taught at the university and wrote long reports full of words, as Satsuki put it. But compared to Akiyoko, he was very quiet. Oh, excuse me. They'll be fine, he said again. And with another, they'll be fine, from Uncle Fujiyama, the truck pulled out of the yard with Satsuki and Mei ensconced in the back. Rattle, bang, putt, putt, putt. When Yatsuko had first gotten sick, Aunt Kyoko had told their father, If you were a little more careful, your wife wouldn't be in the hospital now. That is so stupid, thought Satsuki, who had overheard. Daddy loves us and cares about us. Mommy got tuberculosis because she got the TB bug. That's all. It wasn't Daddy's fault. I don't li like you, Aunt Kyoko. So there. Satsuki looked back down the road. Her aunt was somewhere under that endless blue sky. She stuck out her tongue as far as she could. Mmm. She threw back her head and laughed. <laughs> Big trees. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful trees. How that three-wheeler shimmied and shook. Everything they could see from the back of the truck seemed shiny and new. No matter if it was beautiful or dirty, interesting or boring, it was all fascinating. Look, Satsuki, there's a little shop, May said. I saw it. It was falling apart. You said it. The three-wheeler threw up clouds of dust as it rolled out a row lined with plum trees. It passed a bus stop in front of a rustic little general store. There was a wooden sideboard hanging from the eaves that said, Suru Suruya. <laughs> Tatsuo reached back and banged twice on the side of the truck. That's the bus stop, he called. We're almost there. Inari Shrine? Is that the name of the shop? 
Satsuki shouted back. She wasn't sure if she was reading the characters for Inari correctly. That's right, Inari Shrine. It's a pretty little shrine just up the road here. But it hardly looked pretty to Satsuki. The crimson paint was peeling off the gate. The shrine was stained black and brown from long years of exposure to the elements. Dusty cobwebs that looked hundreds of years old hung everywhere. The three-wheeler tilted as it turned sharply onto the little road just past the shrine. Satsuki and May were anxious to find out what the house looked like. The truck bounded up and down over the uneven road. It bore through a dark grove of trees like a tunnel, then out into the sunlight again. With farmland and shining rice paddies spread out before them. All right, you two, we're here, shouted Tetsuo. This is Matsu Matsugo. Beautiful, don't you think? Yes, Satsuki said. Yes, May said, just like Satsuki. After that, the sisters were quiet for a long time. They leaned out and looked over the fields and forests with eyes that were surprised and a little shy. Beneath a scattering of shiny white clouds and a sky so blue it was almost purple, a line of birds calling into the distance crossed overhead. A pear orchard in full flower swayed gently in the wind with a white cloud hugging the earth. Small stands of trees were scattered along the borders between the rice paddies. Grass-covered footpaths ran between them on low dikes with dandelion flowers wicking up of the grass as if they were tiny yellow suns. The wind whispered softly through the fresh, sparkling air. Now and then the lowing of a cow floated to them on the breeze. The three-wheeler putted along more slowly now. Tetsuo had asked if they thought it was beautiful. But for Satsuki and Mei, everything was so new and different. They weren't sure what to say. I don't see anybody, Mei said. Look there, Satsuki pointed to a group of farmers at work in, in a paddy. See, and there's a horse too. There's no little people, Mei said. You're right, I don't see a single one. Satsuki told herself she would have to see the school and their new house and a lot of other things before she decided whether or not this was really a good place to live. I don't see a single one, Satsuki said again after a pause. Maybe they went to school, May said uncertainly. Yep, that must be where they all went. So it was a surprise when the three-wheeler suddenly stopped alongside a boy loading hay into a wheelbarrow on an embankment overlooking the road. The boy looked to be about Satsuki's age. Afterward, Tetsuo told her that his name was Kanta Ogaki. He was the grandson of the old lady who was taking care of the house Tetsuo had rented. After Tetsuo had finished paying his respects to the Ogaki family, they started off again. The three-wheeler turned down a gravel road that was easier doing going than the dirt road they had just left. Daddy? Yes, Satsuki? Are we almost there? Almost. How many minutes? Should be two or three. Satsuki turned and saw the little boy getting smaller. He was still watching them from the embankment. Daddy? Satsuki leaned out of the back toward the cab. What's up? The boy looked kind of like a fourth grader. Could be. If he's a fourth grader, he'll be in my class. <laughs> I guess he will. He didn't say hello or anything, Satsuki said. He's probably too shy. Really? But how come he's not in school? It's Saturday. Which, by the way, fun fact, kids, in other parts of the world, kids have school six days a week. So they go to school. <laughs> so most kids in Europe, in parts of Asia, Japan, Australia, they go to school Monday through Saturday, where Saturday is a half day, at least to my last recollection at the time of this recording. Uncle Fujiyama kept looking straight ahead as he yelled back, Planting break! A school vacation to plant the fields? Satsuki was surprised. Just for a few days. Lucky, aren't you? Said Tetsuo laughing. All right, he shouted happily. We're home! Uncle stopped the truck and they all got out. A little bridge of stone over a brook that ran along the side of the road led to a stone gate and a narrow path that sloped steeply up through the trees. Is this our stream? Satsuki said. You could say that. Tetsuo said. Satsuki was astonished. Even the fish? Come on, May. Satsuki ran across the bridge and up the path. The trees on either side made a beautiful green ceiling of branches. Tetsuo had told her she'd found the house when she got to the top. And he was right. But as it floated into sight, the house almost seemed to shrink back a little sadly, as if embarrassed to be seen. The house was surrounded by the bushy new weeds of early summer. It looked as if it were about to start listing like a forlorn sailing vessel that had seen too many storms. 
It's falling apart, May exclaimed. She had followed Satsuki right up the path. It sure is, Satsuki almost shouted with surprise. In fact, it looked like a haunted house. So. Those are our two main characters. And their new home. Really, really falling apart, May said. It's not only falling apart, it's falling apart beyond falling apart, Satsuki said. The two girls broke into happy laughter. Falling apart, falling apart. Their voices seemed to bounce off the house in a happy echo. They suddenly felt very hopeful that everything would turn out well. I like it, shouted Satsuki. I like it too, yelled May. Falling apart, the house was once painted brown, but the paint had withered to gray. The red tin roof was molted with rust. The more they looked at it, the more the house seemed about to collapse. The storm shutters probably hadn't been opened for ages. The windows were coated with dust, and the closer they got, the more tattered and old the house looked. They walked around to the south side and found an old wisteria trellis. The uprights and the latest lattice overhead were so rotted and eaten away by insects that it looked like it might collapse any moment. Satsuki gave one of the uprights a playful shove. The trellis swayed and a torrent of white paint flakes fell from the lattice. Ugh, it's raining paint. Satsuki, this is really loose. Maybe it's going to fall down. May was always eager to imitate her big sister. She gave the post a shove. She pushed so hard her face turned red. Pieces of the trellis started falling off. The sisters roared with laughter and ran off toward the garden. There were lots more to see and explore. The garden was a surprise too. Perhaps it was because it had been left unattended for so many years, but it was unlike any garden they had ever seen. They could hear frogs chirping in the grass. A corner of the garden held the remains of a little pond, a weedy depression bordered by a ring of large stones. Ooh, excuse me. The wind swayed, the purple irises growing among the weeds and zinnias, so crimson that they almost looked poisonous. Gossamer butterflies rose up in little swarms and fluttered away. I bet spooks come out here to play, said Satsuki, and she did a somersault in the grass. Then she looked up and saw it. May, just look at that tree. The woods ran along the east side of the yard. The light was dim among the tall, thick trunks, but above them all rose another darker tree, spreading its enormous branches over the forest and toward the sky. The branches swayed slowly in the wind like the wings of a giant bird. It was more a creature than a tree. Have you ever seen anything so big? Satsuki said. Ah, Macon hold it back. Choo! She had been looking up at the blue, bla blue, blue sky with her mouth open for so long that she had to sneeze. The girls were still staring up at the tree with wonder. When they heard the storm shutters rattle, Tetsuo was opening them one by one. Look, Daddy, this tree is so big, it's unreal. Mm-hmm. That's the Sukamori laurel. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Sukamori? That's the name of the woods, Tatsuo said. It's a laurel tree, Satsuki said. Yeah, a camber laurel. It's really huge, Daddy. I think it must be a hundred feet tall. It looks like some kind of monster, May said. It's been here for hundreds of years, so it is a monster in a way. Camphor Laurel. Camphor Laurel, said May, trying it out. Satsuki turned toward the tree, bowed deeply, and put her palms together. Hello, Mr. Camphor Laurel. My name is Satsuki Kusakabe. We just moved here. I'm in the fourth grade. I hope we can be friends. Ah, out of the mouth of babes. They ran toward the house. Tetsuo had opened the sliding glass doors that looked out on the garden. The floor of the house was almost two feet higher than the ground outside. They leaned in and peered inside for the first time. With each shutter Tetsuo opened, more light came in. The house smelled moldy. Beyond the wood-floored corridor that ran just inside the sliding doors was a tatami room with an alcove in the far wall. Something on the floor caught Satsuki's eye. Hey! What is it? May said. I don't know. I saw something shiny. Satsuki stepped up into the house. What are you doing? Take your shoes off, said Tatsuo. But it's just... I'll be right back. Satsuki was so distracted by what she had seen that she couldn't give a straight answer. She was so eager to find out what it was that instead of slipping off her sandals, she walked across the floor on her knees, feet in the air behind her. 
got it. What did you get? May squinted to the gloom. An acorn. Here's another one. Satsuki found a second acorn not far from the first. Both of them were round, green, and shiny. What do you got there? Tetsuo came over to take a look. He shook his head puzzled. <laughs> a green acorn in May? That's odd. At this time of year, it should be brown. He was about to say more when Uncle Fujiyama shouted from the yard. Hey, Kusakabe! What do you want this? He was unloading a heavy old gramophone from the truck. We'll put it in the corridor for now. He went out to help Uncle Fujiyama. Which a gramophone is like an early um, record player. So, actually, I can show you an example of what a gramophone looks like. Okay, so kids, and for those who don't know, so this, it's obviously a digital radio, um, but this is what a gramophone would look like. So this is where, this is the speaker where the music will come out. You would put your dial upon the record and it would play your music. And it was super duper cool. Um, and you would have to grind um, the gears to be able to give it the... Um, power to play the record but once the um timer had gone out it wouldn't play until you rewound it again so that's what a gramophone looks like may tugged at satsuki's skirt what said satsuki looking down may held a slender little hand toward satsuki i got one too satsuki tetsuo returned and handed her a key take this and open the back door to the kitchen okay I'm going too, May said. They jumped down into the yard. As they walked around the house toward the back, May said proudly, This fell right on my head. Her acorn was shiny and green, just like Satsuki's. You mean from the ceiling? Mm-hmm. That's crazy. There's not supposed to be anybody here. The ceiling threw it at me. Are you sure it wasn't Daddy? No, he was out in the garden. The sisters walked in the sunshine through the tall, soft grass to the back of the house. Where had the acorns come from? Were they a gift from someone? Tetsuo had seemed surprised that they were brown. Satsuki opened her hand and looked at the acorn again. Was there something in the house? Mice? Or maybe squirrels? Ghosts? No way. But Satsuki had felt something watching them from the moment she first saw the house. It was as if something vigilant were observing them carefully. Maybe the walls of the house were watching them silently, or was it the giant tree, or the wild mint, or the plum grass, or... The clover looking at them, watching them. <laughs> Satsuki giggled. Anyone in there? She wrapped the side of the house. The house didn't answer. Well, of course it didn't. The sun stared down from the empty sky and wrapped them in light. Somewhere nearby, they could hear the rumble of a passing train. May took Satsuki's hand. Satsuki was surprised. This wasn't like May. What if they're ghosts? Satsuki thought May might be scared, but when she looked out, she saw a curious smile instead. She stuck the key in the back door, turned it in the lock, and looked at May. In that case, we'll just have to ask them what they're up to. But after that, something happened so fast that there was no time to ask any questions at all. The moment the door swung inward, the kitchen came alive with a whirring and a scurrying and a scuttling. Little balls of fluff, darker than charcoal, were swarming all over the floors and walls and ceiling. Perhaps because the darkness in the house was so sudden, after the light outside, Satsuki wasn't sure whether to trust her eyes. The whole room seemed to heave and writhe in front of her, yet the next moment there was just a shabby gray kitchen, like one you might see in any old house. Satsuki gasped with astonishment. Whatever she had seen, a cloud of dust, a swarm of insects, something had fled instantly. Now the kitchen not only looked bare, it looked as though it had been scrubbed clean. Satsuki stood gaping at the empty kitchen and turned to look at May. May's eyes were bulging so much she couldn't blink. She must have seen them, those swarming, writhing, scurrying black somethings as well. May's nostrils were open as wide as her eyes. Satsuki took one look and started to laugh. She gave May's nose a squeeze. What do you think you're doing? Spooks, she pushed Satsuki's head away. This house has spooks. Are you sure? Maybe it's just bugs or something. No, that was spooks. May looked up at her sister. Is it okay to catch them? <laughs> Why not? They're ours. 
Satsuki thought this might be a good idea. It would be hard to relax until they find out what they had seen. Okay, then. All right, may I catch one for you? We'll scare them out by yelling as loud as we can. Ready? The two girls burst into the kitchen, yelling at the top of their lungs, throwing open every cupboard and drawer, then even went into the bath next to the kitchen and pulled the cover off the old iron bathtub to see if there was anything inside. They didn't find anything. Not one single something. It was as if the fluff balls had been a dream. The little changing area next to the bath was dark and empty, too. That's very odd. Satsuki said, where had they all gone to? Maybe their eyes were just playing tricks on them. Come on, Mr. Spooks, come on. May was still searching intently. Please, just one of you is okay. Please come out. Soot spooks, soot sprites. That's what those are. Satsuki and May were telling their father what had happened when they heard a voice from the living room. Soot sprites? Satsuki answered without knowing who he was. First thing they do is run away faster than you can blink, said the voice. Am I right? <laughs> That's Mrs. Ogaki, Tetsuo told the girls. She's looking after the property. Satsuki went to introduce herself and found a tiny, kindly-looking old woman busily dusting the room. To Satsuki, she looked as if she had always had her hair, white hair and deeply lined face. Hello, my name is Satsuki, Satsuki Kusakabe. N pleased to meet you. You can call me Granny. The woman took the cloth she had wrapped around her hair to keep off the dust and slowly folded it with rough red hands. So these are your daughters, Professor. What adorable little girls. Satsuki immediately felt drawn to this tranquil woman. Don't you pay those soot sprites the least little mind now, said Granny Ogaki. They wouldn't do any harm. She turned to Tetsuo. I hope you forgive me. I want to have the place dusted and aired out before you got here. And I would have, too, if my rheumatism wasn't bothering me so. Soot sprites, this old house must be on its last legs. I hope you won't think it's haunted. Not at all. To be honest, it's cleaner than I expected. Which will be just fine. Tetsuo didn't seem interested in learning more about soot sprites. He put the sideboard down in the living room and hurried off to the three-wheeler for more furniture. Granny went into the kitchen, pumped some water into a bucket, and brought it back to the living room. She looked at the two girls as she vigorously wiped down the floor with a wet cloth, and I heard your mother's down with weak lungs, so I was half expecting her girls to be sallow and weak, too. But look at you two. You couldn't be rosier and smart by the look of you. You know, this whole house was built for someone like your mother to rest and get well. A long time ago, when I was a girl, I was a maid in the house of a big landowner. The missus, she had the same problem as your mother. Her husband built this house for her. You see, Sichiko Kuyama Hospital is not far away, and it's famous for helping folks with TB. And I was very close to the missus. I worked hard, and we got along well. I think she chose Matsugo because this is where I live. When Tetsuo had visited to ask about renting the house, Mrs. Ogaki had been doubtful. Her employer had died there nearly 20 years before, and since then it had been empty. The forest had come to overshadow the house, and it was once well-tended garden, and it seemed to grow more dismal, shabby, and forlorn with each passing year. Which, by the way, those tends to be the best houses to remodel, because you can shape it to, it's literally like a blank canvas, so I just think it's cool. Side plug. <laughs> no wonder the children passing by on their way to school called it the haunted house. Your wife has lung problems too, does she? She said to Tetsuo. Well, I hope the house does her good, but I can promise. Now the old woman was almost finished wiping the floor. Can I ask you about the sit sprites? Satsuki said. Are they about this big? Satsuki held a thumb and a forefinger an inch or so apart. Round like dust balls? Hairy like caterpillars? Granny got to her feet slowly and for a moment was lost in thought. They ran away quick, you said. When I saw them, they were off before I could blink my eyes. Do they run away like they're scared? Satsuki said. That they do. Really fast? Like a B-29 zooming away. You mean they can fly? Of course they fly. Didn't you see them? As she was answering Satsuki's questions, Granny moved back and forth between the living room and the kitchen, putting away the pots and pans and cooking utensils. Satsuki followed close behind and May stuck to Satsuki, sucking her thumb and clutching her sister's skirt, following right along but saying not a word. May stuck to Satsuki like glue. There was something about the old woman's familiarity, not unusual for country people. 
that May didn't like. Granny was very wrinkly and dark from the sun, and she had a big wart over one of her eyes. She was different in every way from gentle, well-mannered Grandmother Tarashima. The older the house, the more those soot sprites get settled in, and the more of them there are. Granny pretended May wasn't there. She knew that was the quickest way to make friends with shy little girls. Do they like houses that are falling apart? asked Satsuki. Falling apart and with nobody living in them. Are they ghosts? Maybe not ghosts. They're spooky, though. Has anyone ever caught one? That I don't know. But you've seen them, haven't you? said Satsuki eagerly. I have. That's why you know all about them. When did you see them? Oh, when I was about the same age as little Miss Somebody behind you. Where was it in this house? The old woman chuckled and ran her fingers with skin like dried cracked mud through her sparse white hair. No, in those days this place was just thickets and trees like the rest of the Sukumori woods. No soot sprites, just a lot of big tiger and mosquitoes. May was about to burst. She took her thumb out of her mouth and said, So where did you see them? In the house where my grandmother and her grandmother and her grandmother's grandmother grew up. The old woman beamed at May, but May planted her thumb back in her mouth and half hid behind Satsuki again, clutching her skirt. And that is where we will end for tonight. These chapters are a bit lengthy, but we should get through with this in enough... Oh, it's only ten chapters. So we can get this done in ten days and move on to next. And I'm going to try to find more Studio Ghibli novelizations because most of Hayao Miyazaki's works, works are based off of uh, famous books like Hi like Howl's Moving Castle is Diane Wynne-Jones, um, Tales of Ursi is Ursula K. McGuinn. Um, when Marnie Was There is his son's work, but it's based off of an actual book. So I'll find them and we could totally have like a whole Studio Ghibli themed book festival that'd be dope but thank you all so much for watching i'll see you next time y'all peace love and hair grease